In this video, we're going to be talking about the secrets of the New Testament. First of all, we're going to read Hebrews chapter 8, and then at the end of the video, we're going to get into this really deep. We're going to talk about things that most Christians don't even know. Actually, most pastors don't even know, so stick around. We just got done going through the first seven chapters, and then here the author says, Now in the things which we are saying, the main point is this. In some translations, it says, this is the sum. This is the summary of everything we were talking about. We have such a high priest who sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a servant of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, seeing there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. That's speaking about the Levitical priesthood. Remember, we're talking about Yeshua here, who is of the tribe of Judah, so therefore he's not part of the Levitical priesthood, but of another priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, even as Moses was warned by God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See, you shall make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Moses saw it in the heavens, and he made an earthly pattern of what he saw. And that's found in Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which on better promises has been given as law. Now, I'm not sure why this translation says which on better promises has been given as law because the phrase has been given as law is not found in most other translations. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So this word here, covenant, is not even in the original text at all. It's very important to understand that this word covenant is not in the original for two reasons. First of all, God, when he makes a covenant, especially on his terms, how can it be faulty? He doesn't make faulty covenants, okay? So the first covenant, there was no fault with it at all. It's the word of God, the pure, holy, faultless word of God. And number two, you see in verse eight here where the fault lies, because it says, for finding fault with them, he said, okay? So it's not the first covenant that was faulty. It was the people that were faulty for finding fault with them. And that makes a whole lot more sense. People fall short, not God. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they didn't continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them. This just reiterates the fact that the fault is with the people, not with the covenant that God made, because it says they did not continue. Therefore, the Lord disregarded them, not the covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will also write them on their heart. I will be their God, and they will be my people." They will not teach every man his fellow citizen and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from their least to their greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. And that is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. In that he says, A new covenant he has made the first obsolete. But that which is becoming obsolete and grows aged is near to vanishing away. So let's go over here to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. So this is the scripture that the author of the book of Hebrews was quoting. Behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, 
which covenant of mine they broke, although I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. Don't forget, this was written hundreds of years before the New Testament was put into place. And I should also make it clear that the terms testament and covenant are synonymous. They're interchangeable. New Testament, new covenant means the same thing. So we will use them interchangeably here. So Yahweh says here, I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it in their heart. This word law here, it literally says in the original Hebrew manuscripts, I will put my Torah in their inward parts and I will write it in their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will no longer each teach his neighbor and every man teach his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me from their least to their greatest, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. One more passage of scripture and then we're going to put this all together. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is talking about both the New Covenant and Old Covenant here as well. Are we beginning again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as do some, letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being revealed that you are a letter of Christ, served by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but in tablets that are hearts of flesh. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to account anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Paul goes on to explain here, that the letter is like the ministry of death or like a dead ministry. Why? Because letters on a piece of paper or parchment doesn't really have life in and of themselves. You get that life from the Spirit of God. So the law in and of itself doesn't really have any life to it. It's like dead letters on a paper. Paul explains, but if the service of death written engraved on stones, came with glory, so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly on the face of Moses, for the glory of his face, which was passing away, won't service of the Spirit be with much more glory? Now here you have to catch exactly what Paul is talking about here, exactly what he means. So we're talking about like dead words written on paper compared to the Spirit of God, the real person of God. For if the service of condemnation has glory, the service of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For those of you not familiar with the story, after Moses received the commandments, he came down from the mountain and his face was shining so bright. I mean, the children of Israel, the whole nation said, we, we can't even look upon your face. Put a veil, put something over your face so at least we can, we can look at you. That was glory, the glory of God emanating from him. In other words, if that which is just merely dead words in and of themselves came with so much glory, how much more the living words? For most certainly that that which has been made glorious has not been made glorious in this respect by reason of the glory that surpasses. That's the glory of the new covenant, the New Testament. For if that which passes away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness of speech, and not as Moses who put a veil on his face so that the children of Israel wouldn't look steadfastly on the end of that which was passing away, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains, figuratively speaking, of course, because in Christ it passes away. But to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
But we all, with unveiled face, seeing the glory of the Lord as in a mirror, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord, the Spirit. Here are three things that you need to understand in order to let this be clear to you and your knowledge of the scriptures will just explode. Number one, Christ is the word of God. John chapter one, verses one and 14. Jesus is the word. We see that also in Revelation. Jesus is the word of God. Don't confuse the fact that also the Torah is the word of God. The law of God is also the word of God. So Jesus is the human form of God's law. It's the same law that Moses wrote down. That's why Jesus said, when he was talking to people in his day, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, in and of themselves, you have life. What scriptures was he talking about? Of course, the law of God. He said, but you don't realize those scriptures all speak of me. The more you become like Christ, the more you obey the Torah and vice versa. The more you obey the Torah, the more you become Christ-like. That's why a lot of Jewish people today don't really see that Jesus is the Messiah because they are missing it because of the veil, okay? Because of the veil, they're missing it uh, here and there throughout the Torah. Yeah, they've got a lot, you know, a lot of things that Christians can learn from. They have a lot of good doctrine. Remember, Paul said that the Jews are only blind in part. I mean, not completely blind, just in part. You know, for example, I know a lot of Jewish people, they hold a lot of grudges against Christians. A lot of people who call themselves Christians and did very horrible things against Jewish people, they hold grudges against these people. But they don't realize that in so doing, they themselves are violating the Torah because the Torah says, do not hold a grudge. And that was the foundational scripture that Jesus was expounding when he taught about forgiveness. Don't bear a grudge. And that's just one of several different things that the Jewish people are hung up on. But I'm convinced once the Jewish people really get in line with the Torah, they will receive Jesus so easily. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah so easily because they see that Jesus and the Torah are the same. The only difference is one is written as letters on a paper, you know, the dead words, and the other is the living person. They're both the word of God. And number two, the primary difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the medium by which the law is written. Remember Paul said here that the Torah, the law of God was written and engraved on stones. But then in the new covenant, it is written on your heart. And that's what God said through Jeremiah when he said, I will put my law, my Torah in their inward parts, in their hearts. It's the same law. It's just in a different place. Instead of being written on stone, it's written on your heart. Look at it like this. How many of you people know what this is? This here is an audio cassette. Old technology. This is Torah on cassette, okay? Now, this is a little bit more of a newer technology. This is a USB drive. And this here also has Torah on it. This is Torah on USB drive. This is Torah on cassette. What's the difference? Different location. Different medium. Actually, this is not so good of quality as this. This here is a little bit clearer. Same thing on two different medium. Same thing, just different format. That's what Jeremiah was talking about. Instead of having the Torah written on stone, the old cassette way, the Torah is written on your heart by the Spirit of God. The same words. The same law, just in a different place. And finally, number three, and this is where a lot of people miss it. You need to understand that covenant is not law. The law is in the covenant, and the covenant is according to the law, but the law is not the covenant. 
look at it this way. Today, you know, people get married, okay? Uh, and so marriage is a covenant. So when you get married, that is a new covenant. Does that mean that all the law of the land that existed before then is now to be thrown in the garbage? No, not at all. That covenant of marriage contains the law. It's done according to the law of the land, but it's not the law of the land, okay? It is just a covenant. If your spouse dies and you remarry, does that mean you're under a completely different law now? Now you're it's like you're in a different country, different law, different legal system? No, not at all. It's the same, just a different covenant. And that's the way it is with Old Testament and New Testament. The Testaments are just like marriages, marriage contracts. But the law is the same. The law is in the covenant. It plays a big part of it. But it is distinguished apart from the covenant. So that when we have a new covenant, we don't have a new law. So then those are the three greatest secrets that most Christians even church leaders don't understand. Until next time, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.